everyone and welcome to another edition of Dance Mama in Conversation With. Today I have an absolute treat for you, a complete powerhouse. <laughs> Jessica Ward, Principal of Elmhurst Ballet School. Welcome Jessica. Thank you Lucy, it's lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too. Now Jessica trained as a contemporary dancer at Trinity Laban and we've just been chatting and although we crossed over a little bit on the music and dance scheme a few years back uh, we realised that we've crossed over at Trinity Laban as well which has been lovely. Um, not only did she train there she went on to become part of their resident dance company well-known Transitions and take on a number of other freelance projects um, but following uh, sustaining an injury in her dance career, she took the opportunity to really pursue her other passion of teaching. With that, she taught a number of schools and colleges, as well as holding senior appointments in London secondary schools, before joining Elmhurst Ballet School as principal in 2010, just around the time where we crossed over. Jessica has always had a passion and interest in choreography and enjoyed creating a number of youth um, works for companies, including the award-winning team, The Grange, Opera. In her role of principal, Jessica is chair of the National Music and Dance Schemes Schools Head Teachers Group and is, she's just wildly committed, like ridiculously committed, to <laughs> supporting young people in the sector. Jess also, we have a big congratulations to Jessica because she celebrates 10 years at Elmhurst. Oh yeah, thanks. A whoop and a cheer for that. <laughs> Before we get on to the questions, just to preface for everybody, we are still recording these in lockdown. This is lockdown three for the UK in January 2021. So we've got that little bit of um, a lens on our chat. But without further ado, Jessica, uh, just tell us a little bit about the sort of context of your family setup. Yeah, so um, I have two children and uh, Aria and Avery and they're four and five now. Um, and so yeah, I'm a single parent as well. So um, juggling life as a head teacher or principal and a single mum is quite a challenge, but it's, a, it's great. It creates, um, yeah, it creates a really varied and busy life. And I think the children really love coming to school. They're always asking, can we come to mummy's school? Um, so yeah, so I think that's kind of the setup of my, my family home, um, really, with the two littlies oh, and two dogs as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, hence, hence the quite qualified term powerhouse, really. <laughs> I, I can only imagine Jessica's time management skills are second to none. And I guess this is kind of the sort of most challenging aspect, perhaps, of your work, work in dance and dovetailing that with parenthood. Tell me, tell me a bit more about that, how that works. Yeah, so I, think, I think you're right. I think one thing I've really learned since I've become a mum is managing my time and um just juggling is a really good um word for it i suppose it's just about being really organized and making sure i mean at home it is a bit like a military operation particularly in the morning trying to get out of the house get the children to the child mind of a half past seven uh make sure the dogs are okay get into school for eight um and straight into assemblies pretty much or whatever it might be that day and i think that um I think it's made me even more efficient, I would say, having had had the children because you don't have as much time. So before I would just be like, oh, I'll stay in the office until 7 p.m. in the evening because I can. Um, and now I can't because I've got to be at the childminder for like five, half five to collect the children. And actually, I thought that I wouldn't get as much work done. But actually, I've found, what I found is I'm actually more productive because I've, I've got to get out and I've got to be there for them. But I've also got a really important job to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, I'm sure it's probably uh, saying this end, time to military position. And then also, with, now with COVID-19 pandemic as well, I can, uh, particularly as the lockdown was only announced two and a half, nearly three weeks ago, what kind of, how did that affect your <laughs> <laughs> well it's yeah <laughs> it's been a bit crazy I would say I think I found it really frustrating I think the flip-flopping of decisions and I think it, that creates a lot of um uncertainty and 
um, cortisol in your body and in your brain and um, emotions are kind of running wild. And if that's for us as adults, then that's the same for the students and, and my children. And I think it's trying to um, keep a level head, keep calm, keep reasonable with, you know, the parent community, the student community, but also at home and, and trying to be as flexible, I suppose, and responsive. And I think it's been hard because it's felt like we've been constantly in crisis mode, which isn't really a nice place to be. And we want to do the best for the students. We want to do the best for the families at, at home, managing all of the dynamics of online learning and things. And um, I know from my last experience back in March, so from March when the schools closed on the 20th of March, I think it was on the 23rd, through to May half term, I was at home on my own with two kids, two dogs and running the school. And lo looking back now, I'm not actually sure how I did it. I was like, I think it's all a blur. A lot of it I don't actually remember, which is a bit sort of telling in itself. This time round, because I found last time so stressful, the, the children are going to keep work at school, which does mean that I'm able to, to, to actually focus on my job as well. So I'm finding it more manageable this time even though I think as a country it's more stressful this lockdown because of the longevity of the pandemic and sort of the impact on everyone's kind of mental health I suppose. Absolutely and I think something we often talk about or, or themes um, through Dance Mama's work is the need and requirement for social capital and network to really facilitate and make, make things happen and I think particularly in this situation it's just increased um, that need exponentially and that's that's really really tough and I think I, I would probably hopefully echo all of your students parents and staff um, uh, you know applause and praise for you for, for getting through that period um, in, in those circumstances um, and I'm sure being sort of a loco in parentis for, for a lot of students um, you, you, you play such an important maternal role not only with your own children yeah. but as well and we'll, t we'll talk about that a little bit later so you had both of your children obviously during this um te amazing 10-year period yeah. what support do, do you feel you had um through both of those sort of pregnancies yeah i mean it, it was it was fascinating because i've always been so focused on my career i suppose and as you say i take my job very very seriously and the responsibility to the students like massively important to me um, and so when I became pregnant I was quite worried about being away from the school not because my team aren't brilliant and because they can't cope and if I go I'm not there everything falls apart not at all um, because you know everybody's replaceable including myself but I think it was more that um, feeling like I don't know kind of like maybe a bit of a guilt or kind of feeling like I should I should be there just because I've always been there so um I struggled a little bit with that and my my chairman at the time was just so supportive and, and also one of my governors who actually stepped up to cover my maternity leave so she was an she was a um a head serving in a really um, a highly successful school in Birmingham and she was she was just going into retirement and so I said to her you don't fancy stepping off the board and covering my maternity leave do you and uh, she she did and it was fantastic and because she'd been a mum too she just said Jess you really need to take this time because you'll never get it back and um, she she was fantastic actually so the board were incredible and then my leadership team who you know I'm so proud of them they just made sure that everything was calm and together and yeah so I think just having that network of support through that period was you know I'm just really grateful to all those people still. Fantastic and, and also with all of that support it then has had the knock-on um, in terms of the organisation in that you've developed po policies to Tell us a bit more about that because that's excellent. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, I think, and so we all, always had policies for um, expectant mums and maternity leave and all that kind of stuff, like in, in line with law. But then going through the experience myself, I think I felt a little bit like a guinea pig in some ways. I was kind of trying to think how it would be to be on the receiving end as an employee within the school. Um, 
so as the leader of the school so I was reflecting on that and was thinking actually we can make it a lot better for our team so we've introduced regular risk assessments for expectant mums and and with that you get a one-to-one -one with our HR officer and line manager just so you can talk about how things are in the workplace how you're finding things if there are any issues with your pregnancy um, and also the kind of just information around keeping in touch when you're on maternity leave I think that's really important you know people who are on maternity leave they don't want to be forgotten you're not you know and the other thing I think in pregnancy is I felt like quite a lot of people who um, don't have as good understanding about pregnancy treated me like I was ill <laughs> and I was like I'm not ill I'm just pregnant <laughs> I'm quite capable thank you very much and I found that a little bit frustrating and I think there is a little bit of stigma that comes in the workplace with um mums like, and a lot of people I think you know some people said to me when I was pregnant oh are you, you going to resign are you going to step down it's going to you know and I was like no I don't have to choose I can do both thanks and I think that was really in my gift to be able to do that and for people around me. And even if you think about it, when I was appointed at Elmhurst, I would have been 32. And um, how amazing of the board at that time to appoint me because they would have been thinking, I'm sure this is a 32 year old woman. She's likely to want to have children. Not, you know, not everybody does, but that must have been in their thinking, I would have thought. So that was brave of them to, to take me on, I think. And, you know, they could have chosen somebody that had already got an established family, maybe less risky, all of those things. So good on the board, I say. I think what, what is amazing is, is you are so visible and you're making it really possible for actually that to start not being considered brave but considered just the, the norm because all of those um, policies and principles are already in, in place for, for any, anyone and also you know they, I, I know those policies include fa fathers as much as they do. Absolutely I mean that's yeah and it's interesting one of my team at the moment has just his wife's just had a baby and it's been really lovely supporting him and seeing him become a father for the first time it's been really special and making sure that he has the support because dads need that support too you know having a baby is life-changing you you know you can't deny it's wonderful but it's life-changing and I think people um you know people spend more time at work probably than they do at home so making sure that the environment's conducive to success personally as well as professionally is really important yeah I, I mean one particular area that goes across both um, mother and father that I'm really interested in hopefully getting some more support to do some scientific research in is the effects of sleep deprivation because it, that Ooh, yeah. <laughs> so, probably affects women a little bit more as we're wired yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bond, but certainly um, with dads too and, and particularly jobs where you have to require so much um, reliance on your memory as well as your neuromuscular memory um, and just kind of supporting people through through that phase I know for me definitely I misspeak um, <laughs> or do spoonerisms it's really strange when I've yeah. had a bad night with the kids and then kind of going into the teaching situations which essentially are, are like performing um, you're kind of relying on your your body and your adrenaline a little bit to make sure that you're giving that information to the best of your ability and taking that reciprocal information off the children um, or young people or whoever you're teaching. Also, just while we're on policy, and I want to highlight this because I think this is also amazing, not just about mums, but women in general. Jessica, tell us what other policy you, you're doing. Oh, yeah, sure. So um, the other thing we have recently um, implemented is a, is a policy for um, menopause, um, for women who are going through the menopause in terms of supporting them in the workplace, um, having, I, I'm sure I'm perimenopausal, I'm 43 now, I'm convinced. And, um, I, you know, I haven't checked it out properly, but I, I, you know, I forget stuff all the time and I know that's one of the symptoms. Um, so I think that, it's just being aware of everybody's needs and yeah there's menopause and there's pregnancy I and mean, there's a whole raft of other stuff around mental health and well-being that's also important but I think menopause has been something that's quite often 
not been talked about openly. It's been something that just just happens quietly to women. Wow. The change. It's all about the change, and uh, and it's 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 bad. You know, it's bad that that's been the way that it is. It's a it's a physical thing that happens to us. It's a significant. It can be traumatic. It can be life changing. And I think that um, again, the appropriate support and the environment and culture in the workplace to be able to just talk about this stuff with somebody that feels safe because that's really important. Totally. Just just so good. And I, I really hope that kind of sings so, so many organisations to really start considering if they don't already have something in place um, across all of these issues, then they really, really should. Um, in terms of um, kind of when you took a break to have the children, I know that you were right up until the 11th hour with, with both children. Kind yeah. of what that's um, down to? Oh, yeah. So with Aria, she, um, I think I worked up until the Friday and I had her on the Monday. Um, I think, uh, I think I had a little bit of, um, what's the word I just was like I was just determined and I think some of that probably goes back to determination that's sort of born out of training as a dancer and um that sort of tenacity and doggedness I suppose but I I just felt so strongly that there was this stigma about women in pregnancy and 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 in some environments that I come into contact with through my profession I felt I felt so determined to or not prove people so that's probably the wrong wrong way of looking at it but to really show that it's possible to to be pregnant to be healthy to look after yourself your your mind and your body through pregnancy and I didn't have like the easiest pregnancies and the easiest labors it wasn't like I, it was perfect and everything was rosy but I think it's about the sort of psychological approach that you can choose to take so you can either be like oh it's so hard I'm really pregnant or you can be like yeah I'm pregnant I feel really tired today but I'm going to do something about it and I'm going to approach my day in a certain way so you know I remember I think it was uh, it was Ari's pregnancy 2015 and we had a catastrophic flood at the school like we had the biggest rainfall that Birmingham's ever seen in however many years and I got a call from the facilities team and I remember hugely I was like massively pregnant I was probably about 38 weeks and it was midnight and I had gone into school I was literally my jeans were rolled up I was with my chairman and we were like wading through water I was literally like wading through water like a pregnant whale and um, <laughs> we were literally like okay what are we going to do about it but it you know that's what you do when you're when you're a leader of a school and you care about your school and the community you're committed to it and you and you you just do that stuff whether you're pregnant or not and and as i say you're just really just modeling behavior that you really wish to, to see more of and i'm i have no doubt in my mind that the impact that will have not only on your staff but your students and parents going forward um it, you know and probably already has done is, is is just immense so from your experience what advice would you give to expectant parents regarding leave yeah so I think I took nine months with Aria and wouldn't really leave the school alone during that nine months not entirely and then I took six months with Avery and probably like now I feel all right about it, but I think in years to come, I might have wished I'd taken longer. Mm -hmm. And I remember people just saying to me, just take the time, just take the time. And that time is so precious. It's a bonding time for you with your children and as a unit, as a family. And so my advice is take the time. Work will always be there, no matter what you're doing. It, it, you know, when you get back, it will just be there and not, you know, stuff will have changed, but not that much will have changed. So, um, I was pleased I took the time that I did, um, but I reckon in probably, if you ask me in 10 years time, I'd probably be like, I just wish I'd taken the full year, but it is what it is. Um, you know, I had the tension of feeling torn and wanting to get back to work as well. Um, but also I think it was good for the students to see and the, the kids loved seeing 
Ari and Avery as tiny babies in school. I had um, one year nine group did an English lesson with her and they all, they all wrote stories for her and then read them to her. We've got pictures and videos of that and they sort of watched the kids grow up. So I think that, um, again, from a role model perspective, I think it was good for the students to see the kids coming into the world and they're kind of following them and I talk quite a lot in assemblies about what's going on at home and how you know tantrums or whatever or sleepless nights or whatever it might be because I think it just helps the students see me as an actual human being rather than I remember like observing some of my teachers thinking they didn't really have a life outside of school or a little bit robotic and I you know I want the students to know that I'm actually a person as well as, you know, I'm principal, but actually I'm a human being as well. Absolutely. And, and I think in terms of a, a cre there's a couple of things that I just would love to pick up on. It's kind of firstly, in terms of the maternity leave is the, the space that you have away from work can be really difficult for people who work in the arts, particularly, I think, in dance. Obviously, that's my focus because so much of your identity is wrapped up in that and you will have been you know engaging with it on a very reg highly regular basis for such a long period of time i i too the first time it was com with cali it was completely alien to me i think it was the longest time i'd not worked or not been in a studio and i was desperate like that six week check to get the green light and get an a studio <laughs> just to do some something yeah. uh, what was the biggest sort of change in in terms of sort of the return to work what, what do you feel was the biggest change for you um so the biggest sort of practical change was managing time and practicalities around sort of finding the appropriate childcare and picking up and dropping off um so that's like the practical side of it the emotional side was much harder it was i call it my mum guilt and um i think that I even now battle with mum guilt and parent guilt, you know, I'm sure dads feel the same. But I, I, I really struggled with feeling like I wasn't being good enough for anybody. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't being a mum good enough and I wasn't being a head teacher good enough. And I wasn't good there for my team as much as I wanted to be. And then I think it's just taken me, you know, Ari's five now, it's, I'm still coming to terms with the fact that I can't just stay at the office until 7pm at night. And, and and I've got to a point now where I'm accepting of that fact. It is what it is. And I think COVID has been a really good learning curve for everybody because it doesn't matter if I'm in the office or not. I can be at home and guess what? I can still be working. You know, I'm still there. It just might mean I'm not there on site in body. So we've, we've learned as a team to work differently before COVID because of the need for me to be able, available, especially now being a single mother, um, I need to, I haven't got a choice. When, when that time comes, I have to go because I've got to be there to collect my children. So, um, so the, the team have been brilliant and really supportive around adjusting around that. And then COVID has just amplified the, the understanding with everybody that it doesn't really matter where in the world you are, you can still connect and you can still work. I, absolutely, I think there have been some very small positives um, <laughs> yeah. that have changed the, the way that we work for, for the better. I know there's an influencer called Mother Pucker who was advocating for flexible working pre the pandemic and now it, that's obviously really supported that but she's now moved on to, particularly in this lockdown, looking at um, just the... Um, <laughs> unrealistic expectation that is on parents of being able to homeschool and full-time or part-time jobs um, simultaneously which is a not possible and b not sustainable um and we we speak it's, yeah, it's completely ridiculous it's saturday here we're, we're we're catching up on a Saturday and thank, thank you Jessica for your um, generosity in being able to do that. Does your parenting help you in your work and how would you say it does? If it does. I, think it, I think it really, I think it's been a significant shift so I've always been somebody that I sort of thought was pretty empathetic and could you know put myself in other people's position and try and look at things from other people's perspective but what's been brilliant in my role particularly about becoming a parent is obviously my role involves working with the parent community of the students who attend Elmhurst. So um, 
it's just really helped me understand um what it's like to be them so and i think i've always thought it was really brave of parents to allow their children to come away from school at such a young age those particularly that come to us when they're 11 i've always thought that was really brave and i know that some really struggle with that because most of our students typically wouldn't go to boarding and um but now i just so get it and so i think for me i'm i'm always looking at as a school what can we do to help the parents actually feel all right about this situation how can we support them in understanding their transition to professional training and um i think as well with covid i feel so close to the parent body now more than ever because i've been doing so many zoom calls with them i write to them every week which i didn't used to i'm in email contact with them all the time we've got like a parent contact email address that's monitored by the team and i see everything that comes into that so I'll be writing to parents. I feel like I've got to know them. It's really lovely. Um, but I hope that that helps them feel that, you know, they are entrusting me and my team with their kids. That is a big deal. It's not to be taken lightly. And yeah, you know, we can be flipping about these things. Oh, isn't it wonderful that somebody's got into a like, vocational ballet school and they're off to boarding? Yeah, wonderful. But it's a big issue for a family and for siblings as well that you know with an empty bedroom at home for a brother or sister that's tough um so it's really sort of getting your mind and your psyche because it's really easy to look at it just from a purely organizational perspective but actually trying to look at it from an emotional kind of human perspective i think i would hope helps the parents and the students to feel better supported in embarking on the training and, and just for anybody watching who's not as familiar with elmhurst as maybe some of the ofe dance crew watching how many students have you got at the moment yes yeah, so i think we've got about 190 we take up to 200 to 10 so it's not a very big school but i think it's so my schools in london that i worked in you'd have like over a thousand students but what is amazing about it is the fact that we get to know the students so well and they have unique uh, talents and needs and our job is to really kind of facilitate and nurture that in them and to help them realize their own individual ambitions and they are individuals they aren't you know a sausage factory of cord ballet dancers they are unique individual human beings and what's so fantastic about being such a small school is we can get to know them their dreams and their ambitions and help them in sort of fostering and nurturing that whether it ends up being ballet or not um and that's really important amazing and and just doing the math you know how many if, if parents that you're sort of interacting with sort of three or four hundred people are on a yeah. basis, as well as your team and as well as the students it's, it's absolutely extraordinary amazing mm. so, so good on you there and, and yes the, the, as we talked about that that visibility as well i think is is really key um, I think definitely I felt, and I don't know if you felt the same as we sort of uh, trained and got into our careers around the same time, but there weren't that many role models in women sort of through training necessarily that had parents, uh, were parents, sorry, uh, apart from maybe sort of Sonia Rafferty or somebody. We, we, well, I was just about to say, um, one of my heroes uh, throughout my training and my career and, uh, is Sonia Rafferty. And I remember her um, teaching us when she was pregnant, when she was expecting. And I remember her going through that whole process. I remember her maternity leave. And I just remember just always looking at her with absolute admiration of the fact that she was just there in the studio when she taught us um, she was a mother but she was there for us and um, so professional in her approach um, I think she was really inspiring actually yeah. she's absolutely awesome and I often kind of refer people there's a resource page on Dance Mama um, with all the research that we do know about and of course she Charlotte Thomas and Adele Quinn have written um, the safe in dance sort of the only known dance science textbook for man basically which has a section on specific populations which includes um motherhood with dance and um yeah, yeah. visit the site anybody watching yeah i'll have a good night at that
great, it's great. Um, so the reverse of that is, does um, dance help you in your parenting? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting one. I've been thinking about this. So I think it, I think it does. I think it does for all the obvious reasons. And when you sort of ask that question, you don't almost want to answer the, 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 the question with the way you want to, because it all just seems so obvious. But there's, there's obvious things around like just managing life and time management and discipline and commitment. And, you know, Ari is doing stagecoach at the moment and she doesn't like the Zoom version of it. And I'm just like, my parents were like, Jessica, we paid for the term, you're doing the term. Um, and I feel like, at the moment yeah okay it's a bit different because actually online for a five-year-old doing classes over zoom is quite tough but i'm a bit like yeah and we're still going to do it because actually it's really good for you but um so i think there's there's sort of a balance isn't there between being a pushy parent and all the rest of it but also about that that absolute learning around commitment that my parents and dance absolutely instilled into me and i think that that's huge I think too often now young people can flip flop between stuff and and I think sometimes you have to stick at something to work out whether you really like it or not and I think if you give up something too quickly you can sort of opt out and you might not have fully fully explored something so they're sort of obvious things and then there's just the sheer joy of dance and music and I think I I forget how much I'm surrounded by dance and music just because it's in me and my interests so everything like from films to um music that we have on and like literally last saturday we were all really a bit kind of bored and fed up so we had a disco just the three of us <laughs> and we all just danced around the lounge like lunatics and it was brilliant and uh, when you say dance it's not just like disco dancing it's full on a bit of ballet and some contemporary and a bit of hip-hop and you name it and the kids just love it and it was just such a good way of letting off steam but what I've also observed in the in the children is they've got a real interest in such a variety of music and dance. Um, and yeah, and Ari is just, I think, um, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to push her into the direction of dance. That would be completely up to her. But I can already see that she's almost self-selecting. <laughs> she's all kind of just going that way. She's constantly making up dances and yeah. So. Um, I, I it's, it's just, yeah, I think it's such a, uh, a nice extra kind of dynamic to being a parent if you have got that kind of creative and you're in touch with your creativity that, that you can bring it in. And, and certainly in terms of music in vocational training senses, it's one of my favourite things when you go into to one of the, those um, organisations is here yeah. in the corridor. Oh, amazing. I, I think I logged on to... Facebook in the first lockdown and saw um, Tamara teaching it, um, English National Ballet and it was the music and I just started crying going oh, I don't know when I'm going to get back to hearing that live. Um, just trying to, such a, a, a wonderful um, again bonus of um, working in a, a brilliant well-known world-class vocational place. Last question Jessica. What keeps you motivated, dovetailing parenting and your dance career? Um, I think it sounds really cheesy, but it's it's seeing the students doing well and progressing, and it's um, it's so rewarding, kind of seeing them come into the school as really young eleven year olds and just like becoming these incredible people and it's not just about their ability to dance so their ability to dance is sensational and like breathtaking when you watch them and the tenacity and the resilience and the drive that they have is sort of keeps me going every day when I see them at school but it's how lovely they are how grounded how um you know how how amazing their personalities are and how different they are and unique and I think that um it's a gift really to have that practical element to my job so you know looking to the future goodness knows what I'll end up doing but I love my job so much because it's such a range of yes there's administrative stuff yes there's the HR and the leadership and the funding and the finance all that kind of stuff but 
the thing that really keeps me going is having the contact with young people and 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 that really drives me and I think it also helps me with my children because it's it gives me an understanding to um all sorts around education around what you know what the future might look like understanding sort of kids when they're a bit older and seeing our and Avery growing up thinking oh, I wonder what they're going to be like when they're 11 and 12 and all of those things so yeah I think I think it does sound a bit cheesy but it is really the students and and their energy and ambitions um which are really strong drivers for the school amazing Jessica you have just been simply divine oh <laughs> wrap up and say bye-bye but i just want to say a huge thank you for you're just so open and so frank and, and fantastic and such a important role model for so many people out there younger and in adulthood and just yeah thank you so much for being a guiding light Oh, thank you, Lucy, and thank you for being there and doing all the things you're doing as well. It's absolutely brilliant talking to you. That's very kind. See you soon. Okay, bye.